Hello everybody, my name's Jeremy Agnew. I am the host of the Grim Dark History Podcast, where we explore the intersection between history and popular fiction. If this is your first time tuning in, what we do on this podcast is do a deep dive analysis look at the history that popular fiction pulls into its own lore. You may have been watching a movie, a TV show, reading a book, maybe even playing a video game that had, that set itself or had part of its history a certain time or place or person in our own history. And you may have asked yourself the question, was it really like that? How much of that is re reality versus um, them taking artistic license to make a good story for you, to be entertaining. So this is what this podcast is about. We look to answer that question of what was it really like during this time and place or this person. Right now for season one, what we've been doing is exploring all the historical times and places the Emperor of Mankind has been as part of the lore and history of the Warhammer 40,000 popular fiction universe. And what we're doing here is starting a brand new series on Alexander the Great, uh, his life and uh, his achievements and his legacy. So tune in or, or keep on listening and we're going to dive in. And uh, what we have right here is episode one of the series where we take a look at some of the background leading up to Alexander the Great getting control of the army that's going to invade Anatolia and the Persian Empire. So tune in and thank you very much for listening. To paraphrase the godfather of history podcasters, Dan Carlin, in any other timeline, I would be doing a podcast episode about Philip the Great. And if you're wondering or scratching your head, wondering who the heck Philip the Great is, Philip the Great is who we would be talking about if Alexander the Great had never been born. Now, Philip the Great is not really Philip the Great. It's Philip II of Macedon. Philip II is the father of Alexander the Great. And he is, as you might imagine from my perspective and from the perspective of a lot of historians and other amateur history podcasters, a uh, amazing example of somebody who was both a great political strategist, uh, a great economic strategist, a great ruler of his kingdom, and a great military strategist. And it's rare in all of history to find a ruler of a land that has all of these things going for them. But Philip has those things going for them. And he gets those things in part because of the failures of his brother. Now, Philip of Macedon was never going to be king. His brother was the one who was king. His brother is the Alexander II. Now, this is not Alexander the Great. There are a few Alexanders in our story, but we are starting before Alexander the Great has been born. And instead, we're talking about Philip of Macedon, who is a prince of Macedon. And Philip's brother, Alexander II, who was the king of Macedon. Now, Alexander II made 
quite a few mistakes, and we're not going to touch on all of them. This isn't an episode about Alexander II, but we are going to just talk about one of his mistakes, which was um, ticking off the Thebans. And he lost a battle, a significant one, against the Thebans. And as part of his punishment, he had to hand over some royal hostages to basically guarantee that he would not be a threat to them again. And the hostage that gets handed over is our friend Philip of Macedon. Now, a royal hostage here, that's somebody who is a long-term um, guest, voluntary or not, well, involuntary guest of the host or the winner of the battle. And if you're a fan of the Game of Thrones books or why maybe watch the HBO television series, you're familiar with the character of Theon Greyjoy, who was a hostage of the North. The Greyjoys led a failed rebellion, or were part of a failed rebellion, against Robert, King Robert. And as part of the guarantees that the Greyjoys would not wage war again against the Iron Throne... They were forced to give up a royal hostage. That royal hostage was Theon Greyjoy, and he was taken by Eddard Stark to the north, and he was raised as though he was effectively a prince of the north. He had all the education, all the training, all the wealth, all the clothing, all the privileges that the princes would have except he just didn't have the freedom of movement that uh, another prince would have he was uh, on his honor a prisoner a, as a guarantor against further aggression against the against the greyjoys so this scenario is the same scenario that Philip of Macedon finds himself in with Thebes. The Thebans take him in. They give him access to the best education possible. He's educated in politics, in philosophy, in war. Now, while Philip is away, there is a coup back home in Macedon, and somebody else takes the throne. And once Philip grows up, he returns to his homeland of Macedon. And at this point, he's sworn allegiance to the new king of Macedon. And that king makes some mistakes, just like Alexander's brother did. One is he puts Philip in charge. He makes Philip regent for his young son, who's too young to rule, while he goes off to war against a neighboring kingdom. And while he's gone, he dies. Now, Philip, like any good uh, ruthless ruler at any given time, and you've heard me say this once, you've heard me say it a million times, you never let a good crisis go to waste. And Philip has an opportunity here to get his throne back, and he takes it. He kills the child that he's a regent for, and from his perspective, he's put down a coup that's lasted, that took over his kingdom from his brother and his family. So now the throne is back in the right hands, and that's from Philip's perspective. But while Philip has been gone, he's received the best education possible from the city of Thebes, which was at that time one of, if not the most, 
preeminent city in all of the Greek city-states. So Philip has been set up right from the get-go for some success. He's seen what works well from the most powerful city in the Greek city-states. He's got an independent way of thinking as he comes back to his homeland of Macedon. And he is able to see the weaknesses that exist in his own kingdom. So in order to address these things, he institutes some reforms. One of the first reforms that Philip implemented was to double the size of his army, cavalry and infantry. That's a easy mathematical thing to do. You want to increase your odds of winning in battle. You have more bodies on the field. That's simple math. As long as you've got the money to pay them, you can field as many soldiers as possible. So Philip put two and two together and said, more bodies gives us a better chance of winning. That's not anything that's particularly uh, innovative or genius. Anybody could have come up with that. But his reform to the phalanx is probably the thing that most people would see as significant innovation in military technology. Now, if I asked you to picture two Greek phalanxes facing off against each other, you'd probably picture something along the lines of, you know, lines of soldiers holding large shields, roughly from uh, your length of your shoulder down to your thighs. And from your knees and lower, there's a piece of bronze armor strapped to your shins to protect your shins. You have probably are imagining uh, a helmet with a, a nose guard in front of it and maybe some horsehair uh, crest on top. You might be imagining somebody wearing a bronze uh, plate or cuirass on their chest to protect their chest. And you would imagine them probably holding a spear in one hand and their shield in the other, lined up shoulder to shoulder with the person next to them, with the spear pushed out in front of them. And then you're picturing probably uh, ranks of similarly outfitted uh, Greek soldiers behind that front line with their spear sticking out between them. And another one behind that person with their spear sticking out. And someone behind that person with their spear probably not sticking out but sticking up in the air. It kind of looks like an armored hedgehog of bronze. And then you probably are picturing uh, these two phalanxes as they face off against each other, slowly pushing forwards into each other's hedgehog-like spear formation until somebody finally breaks and then all hell breaks loose and the, the winning side is chasing down the losing side and spearing them from behind. Now, some of you are probably not picturing this at all, and some of you are picturing exactly what I'm saying. What I am going to tell you, though, is that may not be what an actual phalanx fights like. Without spending hours and hours going through the history of phalanxes and how uh, Greek phalanxes fought and armed themselves, I'll say this, 
that, uh, you know, a few hundred years before Philip of Macedon, there is a uh, Greek vase. It's called the Kiji vase. It was found in uh, Greek Italy. And there are on that vase pictures uh, hoplites facing off against each other that looks more like individual lines of people kind of dueling each other with uh, soldiers in the background with spears or javelins and the god Pan standing between them, you know, uh, causing panic. That was probably what people now think the phalanxes originally were like, where instead of stacks of soldiers going at each other, you know, crushing into the other one, they probably think, at least a little while before Philip of Macedon, that there would be an individual line of soldiers... And they would probably throw some javelins at the opposing soldiers before rushing forward. And, uh, you know, as a line of maybe, you know, just one line deep, trying to spear the other opposing line. And when somebody fell or got tired, there was a line standing in reserves and they would run up and do the same thing and there's another line waiting behind them to run up and do the same thing when somebody else falls or or drops that's one of the theories about how a phalanx used to fight and there is an evolution of phalanxes there's also an evolution of the helmets they wore and there's an evolution of the armor that they wore it went from being solid bronze to mostly leather with some bronze or iron plates the shield shapes changed and evolved some of them uh, had that unique rounded shape if if you're picturing the movie uh, the 300 there's a lot in that movie that's wrong but if you look at the shape of the shields You can be picturing that as what a phalanx might look like. And then there's the spear that they have. The spear of a a traditional Greek hoplite was thought to be approximately two and a half meters long, give or take a few centimeters. That's roughly eight feet for our American listeners give or take a few inches. And it's thought that they would hold the spear in one hand and their shield, which was called an aspis, in the other. And that they would line up shoulder to shoulder and effectively get into a shoving match. It was thought uh, to have this uh, Greek uh, principle called Uh, that was the primary way that phalanxes fought. Othesmos is a Greek term for pushing. The theory being that you got your shield slammed together, your your hedgehog-like spears sticking out, and you rushed forward into your opponent and tried to basically pushed them off balance and that would cause the formation to break and then that basically be the end of the battle so the stronger you were the better it was uh, but also the more ranks you had in your phalanx well that would offset anyone's individual strength because you've got the strength of the person behind you pushing and the strength of the person behind that person pushing and so on and so on So you would imagine almost immediately uh, the deeper a phalanx was, it was basically guaranteed to win in battle against a phalanx that was only one or two rows deep. If your phalanx is five rows deep, well, no person is going to hold up against the strength 
of three or four people pushing. But the, it's hard to believe that that's actually how they fought uh, because there are written accounts of a phalanx only uh, two men deep holding off opposing phalanxes that were five or six men deep. And these would both be Greek phalanxes, not uh, you know a, a Greek phalanx versus a Persian one, for example. And you'd think that if it was purely a, a shoving match, then it's hard to imagine that uh, a two-person or two-rank-deep phalanx would stand a chance at all against one that was five ranks deep. So it had to be more than that. Although, you know, an inter another interesting little tidbit just to throw into this uh, argument here, and I'm not arguing for it one way or the other, but that the one of the games in the uh, ancient Greek Olympics was for uh, a, com a competitor to hold a shield, like a, an aspis, one you would hold in a phalanx, and you would have to sprint 300 yards with it. Now, 300 yards is roughly the range of an average archer during this time. So another potential way to think of how to operate a phalanx using this piece of information is you've got your ranks of soldiers, your hoplites, not quite shoulder to shoulder, but sprinting forward as fast as possible to get under the range of opposing archers. You know, you've got a 300 meter sprint in armor, holding your shield and spear, and then you slam into the front rank of the opposing army. It's probably maybe even a leaping into it get as much momentum as possible and then you've got your second rank right behind you third rank fourth rank all coming in you got the first rank hopefully maybe breaking them right away and if they don't break right away then maybe it becomes that shoving match but there's another way to think about hoplite battles and that's the way Philip of Macedon thought about hoplite battles. You know, you've got the spear, it's eight feet long, and it's hard to imagine if you're in a shoving match with your opponent that an eight foot spear would be a useful tool when you're trying to get as close as possible. How could you possibly bring your spears to bear? Now, every spear, because of course, spears would break in the middle of battle. Every spear at the other end of the spear, you know, you've got your, your pointy end that has the blade on it, the spear tip. That's the dangerous part you want to stick into your opponent. But if the spear broke, every spear you could basically turn around and the end of the spear, the non-dangerous end, it might be the end that you would typically stick into the ground if you were just holding your spear and standing there, that end has a kind of sharpened tip on it as well. It's not a, a full spear point, but it is uh, a piece of sharpened bronze or iron, well be iron at this time, so we'll, we'll just stop talking about bronze, be a tip of iron that's kind of uh, sharpened a bit you know it's not a spear tip because that would dull pretty quick if you were just sticking it in the ground all the time but it's enough to cause a lot of damage as a backup weapon if your spear tip breaks well the way philip of macedon thought about phalanx battles is that the spear is really the dangerous thing so we need to get that more involved in the battle rather than it be about the shield and this Othesmos shoving match. 
the more spear points you can get to bear, the better off you are. You don't have to worry about a single shove breaking your entire army. You have to get uh, past the spear point first, and then you've got to worry about uh, maybe your army breaking. So what's better than an eight-foot spear? Well, how about a 10-foot spear? Uh, that'd be better than an eight-foot one if you want to keep your opponent away. You know, the further you are from their weapon, while still enabling yourself to bring your own weapon to bear, the better off you are, wouldn't it be? The aim of battle, the aim of war, is not to die for your country, but to convince the other person to die for theirs. That's uh, to paraphrase General Patton. So... Really, the goal of a battle is to kill the other person or convince them to break while not dying yourself. That seems like pretty simple calculus to everybody listening. And if your main weapon here is a 8-foot spear, then a spear that's longer than the 8-foot one is better than a shorter one, isn't it? But, you know, let's play a little game here and certainly better than a 10 foot spear would be a 12 foot spear we can have a little antiquity arms race talking about this line of discussion can't we i mean we could get crazy here and we can make a spear that's 18 to 20 feet long you know double the length of a Greek hoplite spear. What would that look like to you being a Greek hoplite? You know, this is the way you fought for hundreds of years. The way your father fought, your grandfather fought, his grandfather fought. And there has been a lot of war happening up until the time of Philip of Macedon. Sure, a lot of people probably have the story of the 300 in their heads and the Battle of Salamis. Maybe the Battle of Marathon pops into your head too of Greek hoplites fighting each other. But there is also the, just prior to Philip of Macedon, there was the Peloponnesian Wars. That was roughly a 30-year-long give or take, you know, hot and cold period of war between the Delian League, which is the uh, League of Athens and their allied city-states, and the Spartan League and their allied city-states. Everybody knows about the rivalry between Spar Sparta and Athens. Well, prior to that 30 years war, was another roughly 30 years war, give or take again, of the Athenians becoming basically uh, the kingdom of Athens or the empire of Athens, but without the one single uh, king or person at the top. They uh, waged war on most of the Cycladi Islands and the lands and islands in and around Anatolia, the Mediterranean coast of Anatolia. They became a dominant military force through this, and there's some stories there uh, that we could talk about. But probably one of the most famous um, events from the Peloponnesian War is something that you've probably heard of in some form or another but don't realize where it comes from. So I'm going to say a little quote to you, and it's going to ring bells in your head, even though it's not quite what you would um, remember it to be. And that quote is, The strong do what they will, and the weak suffer what they must. 
if you've heard that in some form or another, that's from the Peloponnesian Wars, and that is a, a written account, well, a dramatized written account, you know, an early history from this time, from somebody who was talking about a Athenian massacre of the island of Milos, which was a Spartan colony. The uh, Melians the, of, of the island of Milos, they were surrendered and not wanting to die, and the Athenians were basically arguing that they have the right to kill them and do whatever they want with them, and the Malayans were arguing the opposite. And this takes the form of an account called the Malayan Dialogue. But this is basically the strong do whatever they want and the weak have to suffer it. This is kind of Greek thinking. And this thinking has been the way of the entire Greek world for generations. And for generations, they have been fighting with this eight-foot spear and this large aspis shield and this phalanx with this uh, form of battle, uh, this form of phalanx combat involving othesmos in some form or another, the pushing, involved in this 300 meter sprint to get under the range of archers and get your shields and spears to bear probably throwing some javelins on your way as you get close so um, what do you do if you're this type of hoplite and as you're sprinting your 300 yards to bear, getting under the range of some archers, and you come across this prickly pear porcupine of a formation that's like a phalanx tank into somebody dialed it to 11. That's what Philip of Macedon did. There is no Othesmos pushing into this phalanx. Your spears are half as long as they need to be to get engaged. You can't possibly get your shields to bear. Even if you could push aside one or two spears, there's another four or five behind that. You know, you, you get a few feet in, there's another spear, a few feet in, there's another spear, a few feet in, there's another spear. You keep going and there's still more spears to go and you haven't even gotten to the shields yet. That is what a Macedonian phalanx kind of looks like from the opposing end. It basically completely nullifies any othesmos or pushing or charging because the ranks of spear points that you bring to bear are so much that it's not possible for a traditional phalanx of eight foot spears to stand any kind of chance of getting through. You have to uh, basically um, flank it, get around the spears in order to do that. In order to do that, you need an army that's bigger than the others or more mobile force. But the Greek army, the Macedonian army, pardon me, the Macedonian army isn't just a phalanx of a hedgehog spear sitting there. It is made up of fast-moving cavalry to be able to guard the flank of your porcupine Macedonian phalanx. It is made up of archers and spear throwers and uh, dart throwers to quickly whittle down any exposed uh, phalanx or soldiers trying to get around flanks as well. So what do you do? You There's nothing you can do. This is 
like uh, bringing a musket to a modern field battle against artillery. You have no hope of bringing your musket to bear because they will be able to shoot you down before you have any hope of getting close. That's what a Macedonian phalanx is like compared to a Greek phalanx of just a decade or so earlier. It's lat far ahead in terms of military technolo technological development. Now this sounds all well and good on paper, you know, if we're writing down the pros and cons of a phalanx of uh, hoplites with uh, an aspis, you know, a large shield and eight foot spears versus a Macedonian phalanx that has 20 foot spears. But there's a problem that we haven't really thought about. That's, that's the practical aspect of how do you even bring to bear a 20, long, 20 foot long spear. There's uh, a matter of physics yet to be discussed here, and that's leverage. You know, if you ever try to hold a, uh, even a broom that's only, what, two meters, roughly, give or take long, you know, hold a broom by one, by the very edge of it, and then try to hold it out straight. You can't. You really need a lot of strength to hold something like that. So take that and multiply its length by four. And that's what it's like holding a Macedonian spear. It's not possible for you to hold that with one hand. You need two hands in order to properly wield a 20 foot long spear and be at all effective in combat. Well, that sounds okay. We, we've solved that problem, but the other problem is, um, well, what do you do with the shield? If you've got both hands to hold your spear, how are you anyway holding a shield up to defend yourself? I mean, our main goal here of our phalanx is you don't really need to defend yourself from enemy spears and melee so much because they can't even get to you. But there is still the problem of missile fire you've got to deal with. So you need something. What do you do for that? Well, what Alexander did for that was he took the traditional Greek shield, the aspis, that one that you think of when you're imagining the Spartans on the field of battle in the movie 300. And again, I know there's a lot wrong with the movie 300 and how they fought, but one thing they did get right was at least what the shields looked like. So you can't really hold a shield that big and still wield a spear as long as the Macedonian spear. How Philip solves this problem is he takes the traditional aspis and he shrinks it down by, you know, 20% or so. It's something that's a little smaller, not much, but if we're not needing to be in a giant Othesmos shoving match in whatever form that took, then we don't need a big giant shield. Instead, we need something that gives us reasonable coverage for missile fire when we're trying to deal with that before we get into melee range. So if we take that Aspis shield, shrink it down by 20%, you know, give or take, it becomes a lighter defensive piece of armor. And instead of being something you've got to hold... When it becomes lighter, it's something that you can instead strap to your arm and have it held there by just some leather 
and fur straps that'll hold it in place on your arm and that gives both your hands the freedom to wield the Macedonian 20 foot long spear so in your one forward arm you've got your slightly smaller Aspis Macedonian shield it's strapped to your arm instead of being held there in your hand so you've got some freedom to raise your arm and lower it in order to defend yourself from incoming missile fire as you need to while you're running that 300 yard sprint to get into melee range and then there's another problem another piece of logistics we need to deal with if we have 20 foot long spears how do you even take an army that's 30,000 strong and then march across the wilderness with it how are you going to carry during a multi-week march a 30 foot long spear can you just imagine trying to walk with that so what alexander does is he takes that 20 foot long spear sorry i know i said 30 a few seconds ago it's 20 foot long give or take again a few inches here and there takes that 20 foot long spear cuts it in half and at that halfway point he um, affixes some uh, mounting screws so that you can unscrew and screw together this 20 foot long spear into two separate 10 foot halves and then you can strap that into your backpack and march along with it and then you don't need to have a giant um, unwieldy 20 foot long spear that you're marching with instead it's just something that's strapped to your back that looks more like a, a couple of flagpoles minus the flag that's much more manageable still has that little uh, slightly blunted tip at the end of the traditional Greek phalanx spear so that if your main primary weapon the the spear tip breaks you can still flip that thing around and you've got a dangerous weapon still but the Macedonian phalanx really takes advantage of the multiple ranks of soldiery behind you we're not pushing anymore there's probably a little bit of that but the ranks of the soldiers behind you are there because their spears are basically the next line of defense if somebody gets by your spear so you've got your front rank of spears which is roughly sticking 20 feet out in the phalanx you've got a guy behind you so what's that distance maybe two feet two and a half feet maybe give or take so at 18 feet there's another rank of spears that your opponent has to get by and we've got another rank behind them so now if your opponent's got by the 20 foot rank of spears they've got by the 18 foot rank of spear tips there's a 16 foot rank of spear tips then a 14 foot rank of spear tips then there's a 12 foot rank of spear tips and then there's a 10 foot rank of spear tips you know if we do the math there that's six ranks of spears you have to somehow get by before you can even get your own spear into the battle that's like taking six rounds of fire before you can even fire one single shot so that is what a macedonian phalanx looks and feels like that's how innovative it was for philip to have uh, created this next evolution in how a hoplite and phalanx can arm themselves move about the battlefield and fight and you can imagine the world of greece 
that has basically spent the last 200 years, give or take, you know, a few decades here and there, a generation once or twice of being in a state of almost constant war. Again, there's breaks, you know, a decade here and there, a generation here or there, in and amongst themselves between Athens and Sparta or Athens and other colonies or between the Greeks and the Persians before them or between the Greeks and the Italians. So there is a lot of war that has been draining away the main resource of the Greek armies its able-bodied male population. Macedon has not suffered anywhere near as much as that. Macedon has been a client state and ally of Persia for a long time, up to the time of Macedon. And the drain of able-bodied soldiers in the uh, main islands of Greece, in the mainland of Greece, the Peloponnesian Peninsula, the Athenian uh, peninsulas, that in the drain of even bodies to defend themselves with, and then they have to face this prickly porcupine uh, 20th century alien phalanx that none of them has even conceived of shows up on the battlefield with Philip at its head and Philip says you can fight me or let's become allies what would you choose these weren't the only reforms of Philip of Macedon to his army aside from advancing the military technology, increasing the size of the army and how it was organized. He also understood that just having extra long spears didn't necessarily make you uh, an in indestructible force. You had to know how to wield that. That's a long, awkward weapon. And flanking maneuvers were extremely common, so being able to properly defend your flank and being able to maneuver in order to attack and wheel and attack the opponent's flank was also a very important feature of how good your army performed. So he instituted some changes in how the military structure was formed. Not only do we have this phalanx, this fast moving cavalry, this archery and missile corps, but we also have, uh, I guess you call it a special type of spearman, kind of a, a hybrid of the perhaps traditional Greek phalanx and a kind of fast moving, um, just kind of flank defenders. Now, in uh, Philip's army, there's two branches of this uh, spearman corps. They're, they're not part of the phalanx with the 20-foot-long spears. These are more mobile troops. They're probably more traditionally uh, fighting like a normal uh, phalanx used to fight kind of prior to Philip. So they've got the, the spears, the full aspis spear, or, or pardon me, they've got the full shield, not the smaller shield on the Greek phalanx. So they've got a full-sized aspis. They've also got the traditional Greek spear that you would see in a normal phalanx. So about eight foot, 10 foot, pardon me, about eight foot spears. And they'll form up on either side to protect, pardon me, to protect the flanks of this um, prickly pear, slow-moving phalanx. So they're able to, uh, you know, guard them. And there's two chunks to this um, spearman core. One is the everyday soldiery, and the other is uh, part of 
Phillips kind of special forces. They're called the Silver Shields, and they're um, veterans of this type of battle. So they're very, very disciplined, very, very experienced, and their shields are uh, highly polished to the point that they shine like silver, and that's why they're called the Silver Shields, this kind of elite forces that you... Uh, you need to bring out when you want to protect the phalanxes during major conflict. And I mentioned the fast-moving cavalry. So there's that fast-moving cavalry that's out there. But there's also another cavalry component. This is typically referred to as the companion cavalry. If you read about Alexander the Great and his forces. So the companion cavalry, these are kind of early types of heavy cavalry that you would normally think of when you think of cavalry. And when I talk about that, so remember earlier when I was talking about how uh, Macedon was a client state of Persia. So they had access to Persian ways of doing things. They understood Persian dress, Persian customs, Persian religion, but they also understood Persian warfare. And how Persian, Persians used their cavalry in warfare is they had melee cavalry. So they would charge up with a pile of horses into a bunch of infantry, cause chaos, try to rout the enemy, you know, it's that type of thing. Greek cavalry is uh, not quite that level. Greek cavalry up until the time is more of a hit and run force. They'll uh, usually, usually, pardon me, usually using javelins or spears, throwing them from a distance, using their mobility to get around and hit people with missile fire, maybe get into melee briefly and then run out. They're not getting into the thick of it type of cavalry, not until the forces route. Persian cavalry is, I'm going to charge you and we're going to get into the thick of it and get stuck in. So Philip uses or adopts that form of Persian cavalry tactics. So they'll charge in with spears. They're also armed with swords when you get to hacking. They'll charge in with a big spear tip charge that you think of when you think of a cavalry charge. Now they'll try and um, flank the enemy, get to weak forces, try to push the enemy onto that slow moving phalanx sandwich them between this cavalry melee charge and the phalanx crushing into them kind of a hammer and anvil pincer type movement so you have these mobile shield bearing spear guards guarding the flanks of this phalanx you've got uh, traditional um, greek cavalry a large force of that running around causing chaos and then you have Alexander the Great and his companion cavalry, this Persian cavalry that Greek forces have never faced before. So there's this all this little adoption, this melding of what works in Persian armies versus what's great about Greek armies and this evolution in phalanx warfare and this is what Philip of Macedon has going for him. We recognize, when I say we, the royal we, the Philip of Macedon we, he institutes and recognizes that um, bravery and especially uh, meritorious conduct should be recognized and rewarded People who distinguish themselves in battle receive extra pay. The uh, more competent and uh, capable um, general people in battle that, that show themselves become officers. This is a way of, of turning your army into a kind of meritocracy. People who are capable advance people who distinguish themselves advance, 
people are rewarded not only in honor through your advancement, you're rewarded in better pay, not only in better long-term pay, but kind of an individual per battle bonus. Oh, hey, you rallied the troops there when they were going to break in this battle. That's an extra share of the loot for you. This meritocracy, this promotion of capable everyday soldiers or giving them pay bonuses improves morale. It recognizes skill and leadership and moves that skill and leadership into parts of the army where it will be most effective. So this enables a hyper-capable army that is armed with the next generation of military technology that nobody has even conceived of yet, let alone seen on the field of battle. And then we've, on top of all this, just went ahead and doubled the size of the army. This is the army of Philip of Macedon as he uh, prepares for the conquest of Greece and then prepares for the conquest of Persia. And I want to apologize. I know in the last uh, few minutes here I've been talking about the reforms of Philip of Macedon to the army and I realize that I've been referring to Philip as Alexander. Uh, apologies, that's a mistake I made, but just you know, for the last few minutes, whenever you heard me say Alexander, I really meant Philip of Macedon. So let's move on and talk a, a little bit about what is the current state of Greece ahead of Philip of Macedon's conquest of the Greek city-states. So Philip of Macedon uh, is going to show up on the scene militarily around 350 BCE, give or take a few years. So keep in mind, 350 BCE is, is where we're looking for Philip of Macedon to be. Now let's wind back time to 500 BCE. So... That's about 250 years before Philip. This is the start of the Greco-Persian Wars. Cyrus the Great, when he first starts conquering all the lands that belong to Macedon, or pardon me, Babylonia and Assyria, he piles through Anatolia crosses into Europe. Now this time this is the nation and people of Thrace that are in this area. Now he uh, attempts to move parts of his army north into what would be modern day Bulgaria, Romania, and Serbia. And that doesn't work out very well for his army. And he moves south through Thrace, through Macedon, and heading into the northern Greek city-states. And on his way there, he runs into Macedon, which is uh, just south of Thrace and north of the mainland areas of Greece. And Macedon doesn't put up a fight, Macedon submits and becomes a client of the Persian Empire. And the Greeks in this mainland city-states, they put up a fight and they push him back. Now Xerxes comes back uh, a generation or so later to try and finish what his daddy couldn't. And this is where you get the Battle of Marathon, the Battle at Thermopylae, um, all those famous battles that you hear about. That's from the second invasion, Persian invasion. 
Now, Macedon actually operates at this during this period, even though they're a client state of the Persian Empire, they operate more as a diplomatic intermediary between Persia and the Greek city-states, feeding the, the Greeks some intelligence to help um, give them an advantage as to the army movements. They help bring about some negotiations to the end of the conflict. But as the conflict ends... Athens finds itself in a uh, position of preeminence amongst the rest of the Greek city-states. Sparta's happy and content. The Persian Empire has left mainland Greece, and as far as the Spartans are concerned, that's the end of the fight. The Athenians see Spartan control over the Greek colonies that exist in Anatolia as a problem. So the Athenians form what's called the Delian League, which is um, just Greek islands, colonies, and city-states, um, mostly islands. And they form up an alliance, a military and economic alliance, and they attack the Persian-controlled Greek colonies along Anatolia. So they fight to regain independence for those Greek city-states that are there. Now, I'm not doing a whole podcast on the Greco-Persian Wars, um, so this is not a very sexy interlude for you. This is the uh, extremely abbreviated Coles Notes version. But following the Greco-Persian Wars, which last approximately 50 years, two major invasions, several major battles, approximately 500,000 people dead on both sides over this 50-year conflict. But immediately following the end of that war is the Peloponnesian War. And it is immediately, in fact, it it kind of overlaps a little bit, uh, depending on who you talk to as to when the Greco-Persian War starts and when the Peloponnesian War starts. But the Peloponnesian Wars boils down to what is effectively uh, the Empire of Athens versus Sparta and its allies. And I say the Empire of Athens because... During the uh, Athenian attack on the Persian-controlled Greek colonies, Athens is the leader of the Delian League that I mentioned, that that alliance of Greek city-states and colonies. But Athens gains more and more control over that alliance. And when when Athens moves the treasury of the alliance into Athens... That basically locks up their control, and a lot of people will refer to Athens at this time as the Empire of Athens. Well, the Peloponnesian War is uh, another lengthy, multi-generational war between, instead of between the Persian Empire and the Greek city-states, it's between the Athens, Athenian Empire and the Spartan allies. Now Sparta gets the rad at the pardon me, Sparta gets the bad end of the battle, the first um, part of the war. And in order to avoid losing the conflict, Sparta seeks investment from the Persian Empire. So the Persian Empire, sure, yeah, you wanna kill each other? Here, have some gold, have some silver. Go buy some ships so you can fight the Athenian navy. And that's what they do. That's what happens. Now the Peloponnesian War comes to an end uh, roughly around 404 BCE. And this is roughly a 54, 56 year conflict. Hot and cold periods. So, you know, that's roughly two generations have been in battle. During this time, Athens has suffered a major plague. 
they've lost a lot of their population. Sparta has lost quite a bit of its population. They've lost a few major battles, but they were able to break the Athenian navy after Persian investment. But during this time, there is yet another alliance of Athenian states forming. The, now, Athens is involved in this alliance as well, in this new war, but they're not the leader of the alliance. They're the weakened city-state. And instead, Thebes, the city of Thebes, is the stronger, more preeminent um, party in the alliance. There's other cities in the alliance that are strong, Corinth and Argos. But Athens, Corinth, Argos, and Thebes, that brand new alliance attacks Sparta again. Now, the Persian Empire is loving all this uh, inter-Greek conflict, and Persia withdraws their money and support from Sparta, and instead invests it in this brand new alliance of Athens, Thebes, and Corinth, and Argos. And they're happy to take money to buy mercenaries, to buy ships, to attack Sparta and the, their allies. So this war, what's called the Corinthian War, lasts from approximately 395 BCE to uh, roughly 387 BCE. Again, this pretend uh, or this depends on who you're talking to and what you're reading. But give or take a few years, we're roughly a 30-year war, yet another war that lasts basically an entire generation, draining the bodies of able-bodied uh, Greek males to fight conflicts. Now you'll notice Macedon is not really named in this conflict other than as a kind of intermediary, somebody feeding the Greek allies intelligence on the Persian army movements during the Greco-Persian Wars. Macedon was what I would ca call lightly involved in the Peloponnesian Wars when the city of Athens tried to take a key trading city um, near Macedonian lands. There was some brief fighting there, but that was about it. So Macedon survived basically 150 years of warfare without having to lose really any bodies at all. This is the state of mainland Greece that Philip of Macedon and his shiny brand new army comes to invest itself in at approximately 350 BCE, give or take a few years. So as Philip of Macedon and his shiny new army shows up on the scene, Greece and its colonies have experienced roughly eight generations, give or take a generation, of near constant warfare. This does a couple things. One, as I said, the Greek city-states colonies are drained of their main defensive resource, which is able-bodied male soldiers, to put up any real significant fight to Philip of Macedon and his um, alien technology a brand new phalanx that nobody has even conceived of, let alone had to fight on a field of battle. So I'm not going to go through all the battles and wars that Philip went through conquering Greece. We want to get to Alexander. Suffice it to say that Philip, either through um, threats, through actual battles, or through political alliances comes to dominate the near entirety of all of Greece. The only parts of Greece that are remain outside his control are chunks of Sparta and the island of Crete. 
that's basically it. Now there's probably, you know, a few teeny islands and colonies here and there. He's not touching the Greek colonies that are on Italy. But when we're talking about mainland Greece and the Aegean colonies and the, uh, and the colonies that are uh, along the coastline of Anatolia, those all come under the control of Philip of Macedon. Now, he's not declared necessarily the king of all the Greeks. There is a nominal uh, alliance of all of these Greek city-states, but which all of them recognize Philip as the head of. And that's what's really important here. Now, I do hope, not, and not hope, I plan to, uh, at some point, get back to the Greco-Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian Wars because, uh, again, you know, my podcast is uh, about the intersection of history and fiction and popular fiction, and there's a lot of good popular fiction that covers this timelines that I plan to get to eventually. So what we've had here for the last little bit has been really the abbreviated Cole's Notes version of 150 years of incredibly complex and nuanced and very exciting and interesting storytelling and history compressed down into about 10 minutes, give or take. But we want to get to Alexander. So we're going to get to that right now. We got one last thing to talk about with regards to Philip before we bring Alexander onto the scene, though. Now, if you remember... Um, just a few minutes ago when I was talking about uh, Philip of Macedon, Macedon in general, and the Greco-Persian Wars, I mentioned that Macedon submitted to Persian control and became a client state of Persia. Now, they didn't stay that way, but they were that way for a while. And Persian influence was all over the court and noble class inside Macedon. These would have been the people that would be politically dealing with the Persians, the Persian religion, the Persian culture, Persian way of doing things, Persian dress, customs, all that sort of stuff for roughly a generation. Some of this, as I've talked about many, many times on previous podcast episodes, you can't be a client state of a dominant empire and not have some cultural exchange even if you're not a client state even if you're just trading with them there's always going to be some kind of cultural exchange so while nominally macedon sees itself as greek and projects itself as greek to the rest of the Greek city-states, there is undoubtedly a Persian influence on Macedon and of Philip of Macedonia, even though he grew up educated in Thebes. Macedonian kings were well-versed in Persian customs and culture. One of those Persian customs and cultures is the uh, practice of polygamy, or having multiple wives. So Philip took quite a a lot of advantage of this in being able to form multiple political alliances through marriage. And the first of his marriages was to Odata, and I might be pronouncing that wrong. In fact, I'm almost definitely pronouncing that wrong. Uh, But she is either the daughter or the granddaughter of the king of Illyria at that time. At this time, and Illyria, if you're uh, have no idea what you're talking, what I'm talking about, and and I didn't have any idea what I was talking about until I looked it up on a map. But Illyria is roughly equal to the region of Croatia and Bosnia Herzegovina today. So if you can picture the boot of Italy. 
And if you are on kind of the northwestern side of Italy, you're going up the coast to where uh, Bologna is, then Venice, and you're kind of rounding the Adriatic Sea, and you're coming down to the lands that connect between Italy and Greece, that's roughly Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, and that would be roughly the kingdom of Illyria at the time of Macedon. Now, I'm going to ask you to just pause the podcast for a second and bring up uh, a map of Google Earth so that you can zoom in on the region of Greece and Italy and Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Croatia. Go ahead, I'll wait. We'll pause. And now that you're there, you can see Greece. You can see Thessalonica, the city, which is roughly equal to the Thracians that I was talking about a little while ago. You can see um, along Greece, as you head to the south of Greece, You've got that giant landmass there with those three fingers sticking out in the Mediterranean. Down around that area, near those three fingers, is where the remnants of Sparta is. And you can see North Macedonia, even today, that would be part of Philip's Macedon. And you can see... Just next to Macedon and between Macedon and Italy is the country of Albania. That is roughly equal if you combine Albania, Kosovo, and Montenegro, parts of that, you know, give or take, borders shift. That is roughly equal to the lands of Epirus. Now, Epirus is not a united kingdom yet. It's still some separate villages and cities and some kind of broken up by kind of tribal family confederacies. It's not a united place, but it is a well-respected warrior class of people that live there. And Philip respects them and they're dangerous, along with the Illyrians. However... um, Philip makes a political, another political marriage there, you know, using his uh, newfound uh, love of polygamy. And he marries the daughter of one of the kings of a not yet united Epirus. This is the king of the Molossians. Now, the Molossians derive their leadership through a direct descendancy with Achilles. Uh, So that's the same Achilles from the Trojan War who dies there. The same Achilles who has divine blood running through him. He's the son of a uh, sea nymph, a Nereid named Thetis and Peleus, the king of Pythia. So the king of the Molossians the family of the Molossians, of their, their nobles, have divine blood running through their veins that they can trace back, you know, a couple thousand years. So they have divinity in their veins, and that gives them a certain cultural cachet. They're also the leader of one of the largest groups within this Epirius uh kind of proto-kingdom. So they make good allies for Philip of Macedon. And the daughter of the king of the Molossians that Philip marries is a princess by the name of Olympia. Now, um, I could do an entire podcast episode, probably two or three, uh, just on Olympia. But I'm not going to do that because there is some... There's a podcast episode that is far more in-depth and wonderful than anything I have the skill or capability to put together. I'm going to reference you to that now. That's Dan Carlin's Hardcore History Addendum. There's episode 9 titled Glimpses 
of Olympias. And he does a three and a half hour uh, master class on one of the most fascinating women of antiquity. That's Philip of Macedon's second wife, Olympias, and mother of Alexander the Great. There were uh, a few books I read coming into this podcast series. Uh, one of them was a uh, translation of uh, Plutarch's uh, work called Lives. Now, Lives is a series of biographies comparing um, various uh, Roman people to uh, other people. Plutarch uh, wrote a comparison between Alexander the Great and Caesar. Plutarch is a uh, Greek writer, uh, a historian, if you call you know an early type of, of historian. He wrote during um, just uh, I think just after the reign of Augustus or during the reign of Augustus. Plutarch is a Greek citizen. He lives literally in the middle of nowhere in Greece. He lives in a village there. And uh, he seems to be well-educated, but how he got his education, doesn't know. Uh, and when I say well-educated, he's at least somehow well-read or well-knowledged. But he doesn't know Latin. He can't read Latin. Um, so how he got access to the biographies of all these various people, it's hard to tell because it mostly would have been written in, in Latin then. And he also spent most of his life living in a little village, so it's hard to imagine he's got a library he can go to where there's uh, Greek tablets handy. Uh, but regardless, um, in Plutarch's Lives, and I'm reading the translation uh, called The Life of Alexander the Great uh, by uh, Victor Hansen, he describes Olympias as a woman of intensity and independence. The uh, culture that she grew up in obviously somehow promoted her to have a more um, prominent way of thinking. She's not afraid to speak her mind, to stand out. This may is much more than her just being of noble birth and growing up in a noble um, household. There are other female nobility in Macedon and Greece, uh, but women in Greece generally, not generally, almost entirely universally are quite subservient to men. Uh, they have practically no rights at all, and yet uh, Olympias is almost the exact opposite of that. She's not in the background. She's out front. She intimidates other men, including Philip. She has an air of mystery and commanding presence about her. And this is just in a few paragraphs by uh, Plutarch, so you can imagine how little Greek people thought of their women back then for him to have uh, put any investment into writing about her at all. She must have been quite a formidable woman. So one of the things that's noted about Olympias, aside from her independence, aside from her ability to intimidate the other men in Macedon, in, uh, pardon me, in Macedon and in Philip's court. She is a uh, priestess or a follower, a devout follower of a religion called the Orphic Mysteries. She's rumored to have walked around or carried around tamed snakes while, uh, you know, during public events and parties. You can just imagine how intimidating that would be to um, other male nobles in Macedon's court or other women that maybe would be at the side. You can just imagine a woman walking around with a snake around her shoulders, uh, smiling and saying hello and drinking wine. 
How uncomfortable would that make you feel even today? Imagine that back then when women shouldn't even be seen, let alone heard. So she has this about her. She's rumored to even have slept with the snakes, which just seems silly. I think that that's more of a, a hit piece, you might want to call it. Uh, but regardless of that, she is a follower of the uh, religion known as the Orphic Mysteries. And if you think Orphic Mysteries, you might be thinking of the Greek hero Orpheus. And if you don't know who Orpheus is, just in a, a very brief nutshell, he's a Greek hero who descended and returned from the underworld to try and bring his wife back from the dead. It's said that Orpheus was the one who invented this religion. That's why it's named after him. Although Orpheus isn't really the central figure of the religion. They worship two people, one of whom is Persephone, who is the uh, wife of Hades. And when I say wife, she's the forced wife of Hades. She was kidnapped by Hades. She spends um, almost the entirety of the year in hell. And she returns in spring from the underworld. And the spirits of the dead are believe to come back with her if you are a follower of these Orphic mysteries. There are two main festivals, the festival of Persephone in the spring. That happens um, just outside of Athens and some plains there. Uh, now the plains just outside Athens is actually where a lot of battles are fought, so there's probably a little bit more to that location um, than we think. But the festival of Persephone in spring, she returns from Hades. It's believed the dead return with her, and you can communicate with the dead. Some of them wander the streets. There's um, drinking of wine. People dress up kind of like Halloween as members of uh, another Greek god named Dionysus. They dress up as members of his entourage of companions and they'll wander door to door visiting people. It kind of sounds like um, some combination of Halloween or Christmas mummering, if you're familiar with that. At the end of the festival, uh, the wife of the king would undergo a symbolic marriage to the god. Dionysus and then um, they would dedicate the final day of the festival to the dead there's more wine more drinking the wine some of the wine is poured on the tombs of dead relatives and then ended with the ritual cry of the uh, population the, the followers of the Orphic religion and they send the dead back to the underworld in the winter festival this one is dedicated specifically to the god Dionysus. It's held around the winter solstice, so December or January time frame. There's a procession. People are carrying um, phalluses, so will be you know carved wooden erect penises, long loaves of bread, jars of water and wine. There's drinking, merrymaking and uh, reenactments of the life of Dionysus. Now, Dionysus is actually the central figure of this Orphic Mysteries religion. Dionysus is a symbol of suffering and rebirth. Dionysus is um, one of the most uh, important gods to the life of a lot of Greek citizens. Not everybody's a follower of the Orphic Mysteries. But you can imagine the god of wine being a popular figure to uh, worship. But he's not just the god of wine. He's the god of suffering and rebirth. In the uh, myths of Dionysus, he's uh, reborn three times. 
He's torn apart and murdered by Titans. He's reborn again. And the followers of, Dian of the Orphic Mysteries believe that when you die, if you are a follower of the Orphic religion, you will die and spend eternity in the presence of Dionysus. And everybody else is doomed to perpetual reincarnation. Now there's a lot going on with this religion. There's, um, if you're you know, listening today, there's probably ringing in your head, well, as I've been talking about it, elements of Christianity, elements of Buddhism, elements of Halloween, elements of Christmas, there's probably some more in there that other people more knowledgeable about their own local cultures and practices are probably ringing bells in their heads. So it's interesting to see a little bit of a few things in this religion. It's not just about drinking wine and carrying erect penises around. But regardless of all of this, this is the religion of Olympias. She's a devout follower of this. And the night before her marriage to Philip of Macedon, she has a dream that a thunderbolt strikes her womb and sets her whole body on fire. And then the flames disperse and she's left completely unharmed. And then the next day, she marries Philip of Macedon, and they consummate their marriage. Now, there would be a rumor hanging over the heads of this consummated marriage, of this bolt of lightning that struck her womb the night before she consummated her marriage with Philip. Now, if you're thinking about the god Zeus, you're in the right ballpark here. Thunderbolt is the symbol of Zeus. Zeus is known to have um, raped or slept with the wives of many Greek kings. Zeus is also the father of the god Dionysus, whom Olympias is a devout follower of. Of his religion so you'd have to wonder as Philip of Macedon might have wondered is the child growing in the womb of his wife Olympias really his child or is it the child of Zeus and not necessarily a legitimate heir one of the other interesting things that's rumored to have happened on the day of Alexander the Great's birth was the temple of Artemis in Ephesus burned to the ground. Now Ephesus is a Greek colony that's on the uh, western coastline of Anatolia. It will be one of the cities that Alexander the Great conquers uh, in about 25 years, 20 years, give or take. Now, as Alexander comes to adulthood and Philip continues building his Greek army and forces, he dreams of conquering the Persian Empire. Now, nominally, he explains this dream of conquering the empire is really vengeance for the Greco-Persian wars. The goal of the war is to conquer the remaining inland Greek city colonies that exist that are still under Persian control inside Anatolia. And in, so under this, with his a divine heir with his control over the entirety of mainland Greece, with his 
fancy, brand new, um, you know, next generation Greek phalanx that nobody has yet seen on the field of battle and defeated. He builds an army from all his Greek allies with only Sparta holding out. The tiny Sparta that he's managed to isolate and now if you're wondering why doesn't he go into Sparta and mop them up, I'm going to direct you to a novel called Manny. Uh, now Manny was written by a... Uh, um, a wonderful person in the uh, post World War II. I think it was 1950s. He wrote it, uh, but it was a traveler and person, you know, an Englishman who lived in Greece. He traveled through Sparta and the what's called the Mani Peninsula inside Sparta. It's one of the most hostile lands you can imagine. There's mountains everywhere. It's very difficult to move an army around this peninsula, this area. This actually um, remains a, a holdout. It's never fully really conquered by the Romans even. It's never fully Christianized by the Byzantines. They hold out for hundreds of years after Christianity has been made the dominant and a main religion in the entirety of the Roman Empire. When the Turks conquer um, Byzantium, they collapse the Greek Empire and they invade Greece. The Turks never fully conquer this remnant of Sparta. It remains the root of the Greek War of Independence. The Germans, when they invade Greece, never really managed to take over this area. So this is a landscape that is incredibly hostile to invasion. That is why Philip of Macedon leaves the Spartans where they are, because he's intelligent enough to realize it's a useless case to bother to go in there, we'll leave the Spartans where they are, and he'll deal with his dream of conquering Anatolia. So with his wife with divine blood, with his heir with divine blood, with his brand new shiny army and military um, uh, officers, with his reforms applied to the entirety of his Greek allies, now that he's built an army out of all these additional Greek city-states and allies that he's got, he's ready to invade Persia. And in preparation for that, he sends an officer across the Hellespont, and he establishes, he's already fought a battle and established a bridgehead for his army to show up later on. He's already done one of the most difficult things that you can do in the invasion of the Persian Empire, and that's get the bridgehead over the Hellespont. Now, Philip makes um, a mistake here. And it's debatable whether he made the mistake, whether something else was going on. But he makes one more political marriage, and that's to another Macedonian noble family. He marries a, a Macedon an into this Macedonian noble family to get more allies, more support, more money. And this new wife becomes more preeminent then Olympias, and she pushes Olympias and Alexander's heir to the side, challenges whether or not Alexander is even a legitimate heir to Philip. And Philip does not defend this, and you have to wonder why. Why wouldn't he want, you know, his eldest son, Alexander, to be his heir? And maybe there's hanging over his head this lightning bolt that happened just prior to the consummation of their marriage. Maybe Alexander really is divine. 
maybe Alexander really is the son of Zeus. So maybe that's one reason to push aside Alexander as your legitimate son. Get a new wife. One who's not so uppity and independent as Olympias is. Maybe he can get a new male heir. But while he's doing this, Philip is murdered. Now there are a lot of different uh, stories or um, theories out there as to why Philip was murdered. He was murdered by one of his bodyguards. The reason for the murder is unknown. Maybe, um, you know, some of the early rumors were it was uh, somehow um, masterminded by Olympias, who was trying to protect her son Alexander and his um, claim to the throne. There are rumors that it wasn't that at all, that it was instead um, the assassin was basically a jealous lover after Philip spurned him and turned his attentions to somebody else. Modern historians and analysis don't think either, either of those stories are likely. They think, you know, it's just uh, both motives aren't really um, probable. And that this is all just rumors that are written about after the fact. You know, good gossip surrounding, you know, who who killed JFK, that type of thing. Regardless of who or why Philip was murdered. Philip was murdered and Alexander is the only male heir. Who's now an adult. Who's the rumored son of Zeus, the heir to the Macedonian Empire, who has handed over to him the most advanced army in all of antiquity that has never yet been defeated in a field of battle, who Persians have never even seen the Macedonian phalanx, don't even have rumors of it yet, there is an alliance of Greek colonies and city-states unheard of in all of history. It's beyond anything even the Greco-Persian Wars managed to pull together. And there is already an established bridgehead inside Anatolia from which Alexander can launch his campaign. So Alexander has been set up as best as anybody possibly could be for what is about to happen in our next episode. Okay, thank you very much. This has been episode one of our brand new series that I'm calling The Ascension of Alexander the Great. If you enjoyed this episode, it would help me very much if you gave it a like and subscribe to the podcast, whether you're listening to this on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, or any of our other podcast platforms out there. Um, everything that you do, whether it's a like, a comment, a subscribe, tells the algorithms that you enjoyed the show and it's going to increase the likelihood that this show gets exposed to other people that enjoy history just like you. If you'd like to give any feedback, um, you can pop onto the YouTube channel. You can drop a comment there. Also, there is a community post on my YouTube channel, and that's youtube.com at grimdarkhistory. You'll see a community post there. Voting is open for Season 2 of the Grimdark History, so you have a chance to steer the ship, as it were, and decide the topic of our Season 2 that'll happen in the summer of 2024. If you'd also uh, are interested in just sending me a note, drop a note on the channel, or shoot me an email, and that's at grimdarkhistory at gmail.com. Otherwise, I will catch you all next month for episode two in our series of the Ascension of Alexander the Great. Thanks very much and have a good day.